but because I work in critical care, we tend to hold on, we tend to handle patients like this day in, day out. So I have nothing to disclose. And let's go by with some definitions first. Sepsis, which we tend to use every day, is a life-threatening organ dysfunction that is caused by a dysregulated host response to an infection. And septic shock is a subset of sepsis wherein there is circulatory, cellular, and metabolic dysfunction that is now associated with a higher risk of mortality. These are the other definitions of shock at the uh, surviving sepsis. And we have the cold or the warm shock wherein there is a decrease in perfusion that includes decreased mental status. You may have a prolonged capillary refill of greater than two seconds, which is found in cold shock, or a rapid capillary refill that is seen in warm shock as exemplified by meningococcemia. And you can have diminished peripheral pulses as seen in cold shock or bounding pulses as seen in meningococcal shock again. Generally, patients who are in shock may have cool to uh, mottled extremities and they always have a decrease in the, in the urine output of less than one cc per kilo per hour. Another definition of shock is actually the fluid refractory dopamine resistant shock, wherein the shock persists despite giving greater than 60 ml per kilo of fluid resuscitation in the first hour and with dopamine infusion of 10 mics per kilo per minute. Catecholamine resistant shock is when you still have the signs and symptoms of shock which persists despite you have started epinephrine and norepinephrine. And refractory shock is really, really very bad because the shock persists despite everything that you've given to your patient. Now, septic shock, which used to be known as severe sepsis, this is where you have greater than, greater than or equal to two age-based systemic inflammatory response syndrome criteria, you have a confirmed or suspected invasive infection, usually bloodstream. You have cardiovascular dysfunction or ARDS, and you have two or more non-cardiovascular organ system dysfunction. In the past 2005, the definition of septic shock is actually just severe sepsis plus cardiovascular dysfunction wherein you have hypotension and impaired perfusion. The 2020 definition of septic shock is severe infection that leads to cardiovascular dysfunction, wherein you have hypotension that needs vas vas vasoactive drugs or there is impaired perfusion. But this is the definition of shock that I love to use because it's very simple. It is a syndrome that results from inadequate delivery of oxygen to meet the metabolic demands of the tissue. So delivery of oxygen is DO, the delivery of oxygen is less than the oxygen consumption. And if you don't pay attention to this and it is left untreated, you now would end up with metabolic acidosis, organ dysfunction, and sadly, death. So oxygen delivery is actually the product of cardiac output and the arterial oxygen content. So cardiac output, on the other hand, is the product of heart rate times the stroke volume. So whenever a patient comes in to us who is in shock, wherein there is a decrease in cardiac output, they are most often than not tachycardic, and it is worrisome if they're bradycardic because it means to say that they are already in the brink of death. You know? When a patient is coming in 
without an IV, then there's no way for them to increase the stroke volume because by this time they are not taking anything by mouth. The stroke volume is determined by the preload. So that's either you take something by mouth or you're given an IV. It is determined by the afterload and of course the contractility of the heart. On the other hand, the arterial oxygen content is actually the content of oxygen in the RBC plus the dissolved oxygen in plasma. So if you look at this formula, the only way for you to significantly increase the oxygen content in the blood is actually to improve the hemoglobin. The partial pressure of oxygen is only 0.003 as a factor to the content of oxygen. Now, this is a classification of shock that is so old, but it is very, very helpful. Whenever I see a patient who seems to be in shock, I always run through this in my head. If the patient still has vital signs that are still within normal or borderline normal with a BP that's still normal, then the patient is still compensating. So that's compensated shock. If you already have microvascular perfusion that is marginal, organ and cellular function that is deteriorating and there is already hypotension, then that's uncompensated shock. And if despite everything that you have done, you don't get to seem to reverse it, then of course that is irreversible shock. So it is important that early diagnosis would require a high index of suspicion. And the diagnosis is through the physical exam focusing on tissue perfusion. So what are, what are these? You have to look at the mental status. You have to look at your vital signs, the blood pressure, the heart rate, the respiratory rate. You have to look at the pulses, both central and peripheral. You look at the perfusion of the extremities. You feel the temperature of the hands and feet. And you compare that with the ambient room temperature. So if you're if your room temperature is not very cold, then this patient should not be very cold also with the hands and feet. Okay, so with this, plus a little history on when was the last urine output, will give you an idea if you're dealing with a patient who is in shock. And of course, abject hypotension is actually a late sign and a pre-morbid sign. Now, I've shown this slide a long time ago, and I still am showing this because this is the only study that has shown that fluids is still very important. This study was done at the era wherein there was no such thing as animal rights, and the, the laboratory animals, they were placed an arterial, an aortic, cannula, no sedation, no pain medicines, and all they did was they kept on extracting the blood volume until eventually you have a, you have a, a laboratory animal that succumbs to death. No? So from here, you can see that if there is 25% of plasma loss, your blood pressure is still okay, your cardiac output has dropped a bit. And the reason why your blood pressure is still okay is because the vascular resistance has started to climb up. Now, what is 25% of plasma loss? If you have a 10 kilogrammer, the total blood volume of a 10 kilogrammer is 80 cc per kilo. So that is 800 cc's. And get, if you get 25% of 800, that's 200 cc's. And from there, the 20 cc per kilo was born. So as I've mentioned earlier, a fluctuating mental status 
and an infant with sunken anterior fontanelle, children with cool extremities, pale looking, mottled skin, cyanotic, poor capillary refill, weak peripheral pulses, and poor muscle tone. These are actually not good physical exam findings already. Most of the time, these patients are tachypnic or hyperpnic, and of course, they're tachycardic. And by physical exam or by history, these patients would have very little urine. So the differential diagnosis that we have to consider whenever we are thinking of shock is the five more common causes of shock. And one is hypovolemia, that is exemplified by hemorrhage, uh, plasma or serum loss, or GI tract loss, or because of excessive use of the drugs like furosemide. You may have distributive cause of shock like anaphylaxis, neurogenic, and what we always use, the septic shock. You may have cardiogenic shock, which wherein there is myocardial injury or it's uh, dysrhythmia, as exemplified by supraventricular tachycardia or ventricular dysrhythmias, or is it a congenital heart disease that is ductal dependent, like severe uh, pulmonary valve stenosis, severe aortic stenosis, severe coarctation of the aorta. You know, these are typical examples of ductal dependent lesions. You may have obstructive causes of shock as in pneumothoraces, cardiac tamponade, and of course, aortic dissection. Dissociative causes of shock would be heat stroke, carbon monoxide poisoning, cyanide poisoning, and of course, the other endocrine abnormalities. So the precise etiologic classification may actually be a bit delayed if you want to identify it, because the immediate treatment is very essential. Absolute or relative hypovolemia is usually present, and that's the reason why fluids is always the mainstay in the initial management of shock. If you, are, if you are able to do a chest x-ray, looking at the cardiac silhouette on the x-ray film can make you understand or make you feel assured whether or not you really need volume resuscitation. So the goal in the management of patients with shock would of course to be to increase the oxygen delivery and to decrease the oxygen demand. So obviously we give a little oxygen, even if the SATs are still 100% with a patient that is very tachycardic, tachypnic, a little oxygen will always be helpful. We have to give fluids. We have to control the temperature. We'd never like children who are highly febrile. We need to give our antibiotics as soon as possible the moment we consider an infection. And we have to correct the metabolic abnormalities like hypoglycemia or the electrolyte abnormality, hyponatremia, hypernatremia, hypokalemia, and hypocalcemia. And of course, after everything has been done, then we can decide, do we want to start an inotrope? So if you notice the inotrope starting for a patient that is not a known cardiac is not the first in the list of management. With regards to the airway, if the patient cannot seem to protect his or her airway or the airway is not maintainable, then you have no choice but to assist the patient and intubate. And whenever you want to assist the breathing, you always want to start off with 100% oxygen and be guided with your pulse oximeter because the pulse oximeter will give you an idea of how much saturation is in the blood. And it will give you the pulse reading for which if it has the waveform, then it can give you an idea of how much, how good the peripheral pulses are. 
And of course, for the circulation, you have to establish intravenous access rapidly. So give yourself um, two to three attempts for peripheral. And if it, you still cannot do it, then you highly consider the intraosseous route. Okay, and put the patient on the cardiac monitor so that you can have the blood pressure monitored more frequently than every hour. For the laboratories, this will always be dependent on what is your working impression. You know, there's no such thing as a decahon laboratory for critical care. All the labs, all the blood that you want to send has to have a special reason. So we always work with volume expansion and we would like to optimize the preload. And amongst the fluids that we have, the normal saline or the lactated ringers are the, the ones that we normally will use, the crystalloids. Um, in patients with possible myocardial involvement, to say from history, we, you are told that the patient is a known cardiac patient then try not to give 20 cc per kilo, you go a bit lower, five to 10 cc per kilo, but you may have to assess and reassess if you need to give a bit more. You can give as much up to 40 to 60 cc's per kilo, and then you need to assess and reassess for ongoing losses, adrenal status, intestinal ischemia, for which your abdominal birth will be distended. Are you dealing with obstructive shock? You may want to do a chest X-ray. And if after everything, your patient still is not improving, then you may consider to give a colloid. No, but be very careful with colloids because in patients with renal failure, giving colloids is not helpful. And then further fluid therapy should be guided by the response. By this time, you can do your laboratories and possibly insert the CVP and again, look at your chest X-ray. So for the cardiac or distributive causes of shock, wherein there's no fluid loss, there's a history of heart disease. You have a patient with brows, cardiomegaly and hepatomegaly with no improvement on oxygenation, ventilation and fluids, then you can give your cardiac drugs, but you need to establish what are you aiming for and the endpoints. So for the cardiac drugs, you have epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, dobutamine, and of course, plus prostaglandin that is used in the neonatal age group. Now, let's go to the more common causes of shock. Hypovolemic shock is the most common form of shock worldwide. And this is because of a decrease in circulating blood volume. There will be a decrease in the preload and the stroke volume, and eventually causing a decrease in cardiac output. Causes of this can actually be trauma, so you have hemorrhage. You can have renal losses, so... Uh, an increase in urine output or an increase in GI tract losses or the capillary leak syndromes. Clinically, there, should, there would be a history of vomiting, diarrhea, trauma, or blood loss. And the signs of dehydration would of course be the mucous membranes, tears, and of course the skin turgor. Patients would always be hypotensive, tachycardic without signs of congestive heart failure. If it is hemorrhagic shock, the most common cause of that would be, of course, trauma. And this may be present in the history, but if it is not that obvious, then you have to consider child abuse. The site of blood loss can either be obvious or it can be concealed. And if it is concealed, the organs that can conceal that would be the liver, the spleen, the brain, and of course, the GI tract. So these patients would always be hypotensive, tachycardic, and they look pale. 
So in patients with hypovolemic or hemorrhagic shock, always begin with the ABCs. Replace the circulating blood volume rapidly, starting with the 3 ml crystalloid to 1 ml estimated blood loss. Blood products would be, should be given as soon as possible, and they should be type and cross with the first blood extraction for hemorrhagic shock. And you need to replace ongoing losses or blood losses. And of course, don't forget to treat the underlying cause. Now, if in case this patient is a trauma patient and initially you cannot appreciate the blood pressure, you, you would want to give volume or blood, but do not aim for the normal blood pressure because if it is an intra-abdominal bleed, aiming for the normal blood pressure may cause the, the clot has formed to be dislodged and that may cause more bleeding. And that's the reason why in trauma centers, they go for permissive hypotension. So as long as there is an improvement in the perfusion, as long as there is some pulses that they could feel, then urgently they bring the patient to the surgical suite. Now, we are very common we commonly see patients with septic shock. And in the warm phase of shock, the, these patients are compensated and in a hyperdynamic state. Clinically, their extremities are still warm. The pulses are still bounding. The patient's tachycardic, tachypnic, but confused. By blood pressure, you would see a widened pulse pressure. And if you had uh, monitoring of the heart, you would be able to see an increase in cardiac output. And through the central venous line, you can check for mixed venous oxygen saturation, and that will also be increased. And the patient would have a decrease in systemic vascular resistance. Biochemically or laboratory-wise, you can show hypocarbia because the patient's tachypnic, elevation of the lactic acid, and of course, stress hyperglycemia. When, when the patient is not responding well, they would eventually go to the cold phase of shock. And here you have uncompensated stage with a decrease in cardiac output. These patients would tend to look cyanotic, cold clammy extremities, rapid thready pulses with shallow breathing. By, by the time that you have this patient at this state, your, your mixed venous oxygen saturations may start dropping. Your cardiac output also drops and the CVP may actually be going down with an increase in systemic vascular resistance. So on CBC, you may find thrombocytopenia because you now have low-grade DIC. You would have oliguria, myocardial dysfunction, and of course, capillary leak. Laboratory-wise, you would have metabolic acidosis either by venous blood gas or arterial blood gas. You would have hypoxemia through the arterial blood gas or the pulse oximetry. Then you would have coagulopathy as exemplified by the abnormal uh, PT, PTT, and of course, the bleeding time, clotting time, clot reaction time. And don't forget to check your patients because they could also be hypoglycemic. So patients with cold shock can rapidly progress into multi-organ system failure and eventual death. And in this situation, these patients would, have, would actually be comatose, they have ARDS, they have congestive heart failure, they have renal failure, they also have ileus or gastric hemorrhage, and disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. The more the organ systems that is involved, the worse is the prognosis. Treatment is still the ABCs, fluids, appropriate, immediate antimicrobial, and of course, treat the underlying cause. So let's go to cardiogenic shock. The causes of this would be a dysrhythmia, so either it's 
too fast or too slow. Uh, may drain sa wheel. Yeah, in, infection, uh, metabolic causes, obstructive causes, drug intoxication like uh, a patient who ingested a calcium channel blocker or congenital heart disease and trauma. To differentiate this from the other types of shock would of course be the history and these patients usually have an enlarged liver, an abnormal rhythm, presence of a murmur for which there was previously no murmur, and of course, rals, no? And on chest x-ray, you would have an enlarged heart or what we call a generous heart, and you may have pulmonary venous congestion. Management, of course, would be to improve cardiac output. So correct the dysrhythmias, Optimize the preload by giving a little fluids, a little chrysaloid. Improve the contractility by using your inotrope agents and try to reduce afterload by, by, by decreasing the afterload in a myocardium that is not having the capability of pumping out the blood you can actually give a little inotrope and a little afterload unloader and the effect of which would be you can improve cardiac output and the blood pressure will eventually go up. Because a lot of people are afraid to give an afterload unloader for fear that it may make the hypotension worse. However, if you're giving a little inotropy a little volume, and a little decrease in the afterload, you'll be surprised the cardiac output will be maintained. Then you also want to minimize the cardiac work, and therefore you try to maintain normal temperature. You try to sedate the patient, and if the patient is on mechanical ventilation for which he or she is intubated, then you want to put the settings of the mechanical ventilation on full support, no? Because you, are, you already know that your patient is not ready for spontaneous breathing. Whenever you, your ventilatory support is not uh, adjusted properly to give full support, the patient will be having spontaneous breathing. And as the respiratory muscles are working to breathe, they will need extra blood flow to the respiratory muscles and you, in, a, in effect, increase the workload of the heart and your heart is in failure. So whenever you're handling a patient with a cardiac cause of failure and you are intubating this kid, your goal is to give the mechanical ventilatory full support to decrease the myocardial oxygen consumption. And in this situation, you would like to also correct the anemia because the myocardium is the only organ in the body that does not rest. So even if you're already sleeping or you're in REM sleep, your heart is still pumping. And you have to remember, the moment the heart decides to rest, your patient is in trouble. Now, distributive shock, this is an abnormality in the vascular tone that leads to peripheral pooling of blood, resulting in relative hypovolemia. Anaphylactic shock is a classic example. Drug toxicity is another one. Neurogenic shock, wherein there's loss of the sympathetic tone and, of course, early septicemia. So management, of course, would be fluids, treat the underlying cause, and of course, the vasoconstrictors. Patients with obstructive shock give mechanical obstruction. If there is mechanical obstruction to the ventricular flow, like aortic stenosis, if the patient has congestive, a congenital heart disease, massive pulmonary embolism, tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, all of these 
you'd still need to resuscitate these patients, but definitive management would need to be done. Here you have an inadequate cardiac output in the face of an adequate preload and contractility. So the preload is still okay, but because of the obstruction, the treatment still is to increase the preload a bit more so that you're able to have some improvement in the cardiac output. Patients with tamponade would actually have a narrow pulse pressure. So I wrote here, management would be aggressive. So once you recognize it, you have to be aggressive with the fluids, treat the underlying cause, and don't worry about congestion because congestion can be treated later on. Patients with dissociative shock were in the inability of the, of the hemoglobin to give up oxygen to the tissues. So etiology-wise, you have carbon monoxide poisoning, meth hemoglobinemia, the dishemoglobinemias, and of course, the cyanide poisoning. So people have thought that we don't see this. Actually, carbon monoxide poisoning is very common in smoke inhalation or burn houses, no? Meth hemoglobinemia, very common in patients who are using well water for their drink, especially so if they have relative anemia and they're using the well water because the meth hemoglobin can actually be there. And you know that you have possible meth hemoglobinemia is because your blood is chocolate brown. In the moment that you give uh, the antidote, which is the methylene blue, in front of you, the blood will actually turn red. For cyanide poisoning, here, if you do the arterial blood gas, whatever is the PO2 in the arterial blood gas, you can actually compare that with the venous blood gas. And in patients with severe cyanide poisoning, the venous PO2 will almost be the same as the arterial PO2. And that's the reason why in carbon monoxide poisoning and cyanide poisoning, these patients do not look cyanotic. And the only way for you to suspect is that when you take the venous blood, you'll be surprised that it is bright red. And when you compare it with the arterial blood, it is also bright red. And from the history, you would now get an idea of where the patient got the cyanide. Tissue perfusion in these patients are adequate, but the oxygen release to the tissue is not going on. And therefore, you would have an elevation of the lactic acid. And therefore, early recognition and treatment is the cause. Of the cause is the main treatment plus the supportive treatment. Okay. So this is just a tabulation of the parameters that we use. We still have the CVP, or we sometimes have the CVP. You can still measure the blood pressure and calculate for the mean arterial pressure. You can have a sense of the systemic vascular resistance. And of course, the cardiac output can be uh, evaluated through echo. So in hypovolemia, you actually have a drop in the CVP. In cardiogenic shock, you would have an increase in the systemic vascular resistance with a decrease in cardiac output. Patients with obstructive shock, you actually would have a slight increase in the systemic vascular resistance. And of course, your cardiac output is decreased. Patients with distributive shock, you would have a decrease in systemic vascular resistance because your patients have bounding pulses and you would have an increase in cardiac output, and of course, your CVP can actually be still be normal or decreased. In early parts of septic shock, it will be almost similar to the distributive shock. And in the late part of septic shock, it will be almost similar 
to the cardiogenic shock. So let's just run through a, uh, an actual case that we handled. This is a five-year-old male who was brought to the emergency room because of a decreased responsiveness. He had fever five days prior. He did not eat or drink. And mom claims that there was no urine since last night. No meds were given because he keeps on vomiting. Pertinent in the history, this is a five-year-old with a developmental age of one to two months. So you, all, you already know that this patient is developmentally delayed. The patient was previously seen in the outpatient because of poor weight gain. An NGT was inserted, but the patient frequently vomits, so the mom decided the NGT was not doing anything good, so the mom removed the NGT. And since then, mom has been trying to feed this kid by mouth. So upon arrival at the emergency room, the patient had no pulse, the patient was cold, no appreciable blood pressure. The patient still is tachycardic at 180 to 200 per minute and was bradypneic. Obviously, if you see a patient like this, you already know that the patient is in the brink of death. And of course, the patient would not respond to any painful stimuli and no verbal response and no response to verbal. Pertinent in the physical exam, the eyeballs are sunken. The pupils are three millimeters, still briskly reactive to light. The patient has dry lips, tachycardic, clear breath sounds. The abdomen seems to be firm. We cannot tell if the patient has response to tenderness, but sadly, this patient has multiple cut downs on the neck, the arms, and the legs. So this is going to be a challenge, how to put an access. The patient has cool extremities with prolonged capillary refill. So it's a simple question. Is the patient in shock? Obviously, the patient is in shock. What type of shock? The patient has not been feeding. Could be hypovolemic. The patient has had fever. In the, in the history, the patient had fever. And therefore, you can't to consider the possibility of sepsis. And the patient had no urine output, so the patient could actually be dry, okay? And the patient has no blood pressure. The patient is tachycardic, bradypneic. Definitely this kid needs to be taken care of quick and multiple cut downs. What should be done? We should definitely resuscitate check the airway, the breathing. The breathing is predictive, so we should assist the breathing already. And we need to get an access. So the harder question is, how would you know enough is enough, okay? First thing first, don't worry about the enough is enough. Get the patient out of shock first. That is, you have to prioritize the problems of this patient and not be overwhelmed with so many problems. So no IV access could be established and there was a questionable tenderness of the abdomen. The surgeon was called and luckily he came right away and very lucky a subclavian line was placed. And of course they wanted to do a CT scan. Of course that is just the plan. You can't do a CT scan with a patient that is not stable. Patient was intubated and hooked to the ventilator and I told them we have to put the patient on maximum ventilatory support. The subclavian was placed via ultrasound and the chest x-ray was done to check the placement of the endotracheal tube and the subclavian line. So when the subclavian was placed immediately, 220 cc per kilo was of normal saline was given. And thereafter, we checked the venous blood gas and we saw a pH of 7.40, CO2 of 54, a venous PO2 of 36, and a bicarb of 34 with a 68% saturation. Using the venous blood gas, you can only have an idea of the pH and the PCO2. You cannot make a comment on the oxygenation. But 
we know that the venous saturation should actually be 70%. And since the patient, despite the fact that the, he received 40 cc per kilo, there was no blood pressure that could be um, obtained. So we decided to start this patient immediately on a dose of vasopressin. And the patient was wheeled up to the ICU. So upon arrival at, uh, at the ICU, the patient is still tachycardic at 180 to 210 per minute. It was sinus tachycardia based on the cardiac monitor, but this time you were able to get a little blood pressure, 66 to 67 over 34 to 40. We repeated the mixed venous oxygen, such, um, we repeated the venous blood gas again, because there was no way for us to do arterial blood gases. pH was 7.39 from 7.40. PCO2 is just a little bit higher, 56 from 54. The PO2 really dropped. The bicarb is the same and the SATs have gone down 46%. So that means to say with a normal of 70% and SATs are now 46%, it's telling me that this patient is third spacing or losing fluid somewhere. So we gave another 20 cc per kilo, which we literally pushed it in for 15 minutes, rest for 20 minutes for it to stabilize. Then we repeated the blood gas and it went up, the saturations went up from 46% to 58%. We gave another 20 cc per kilo because technically I was aiming for 70 cc, 70% 70 saturation. We gave another 20 cc per kilo and the repeat venous blood gas showed a SATS of 66%. We gave another 20 cc per kilo and the repeat was 68%. So from 66 to 68, the improvement wasn't that great, but we wanted to test this, test this kid. So we gave another 20 cc per kilo and look what happened, the SATs went down to 51%. So that's already telling me that maybe this kid needs a little inotropic support because the myocardium cannot seem to handle the extra 20 cc per kilo. Eventually this patient was, became hemodynamically stable. Abdominal CT scan, was a, we were able to do that and it showed multiple abscesses with a ruptured appendix. So the patient underwent exploratory laparotomy with the removal of the appendix and cleaning up of the abdomen, managed with cefoxetine. And because of the repetitive vomiting by history, when challenged with pedialyte, the patient again vomited. So we did an upper GI series and it showed that there was no obstruction. Abdominal ultrasound was done. There was no abscess. So we decided to resume the feeding, but this time making it slower and added domperidone. Eventually the patient went home. The second case is a two-year-old, nine kilogrammer who had, who had fever, non-bloody diarrhea, and was vomiting. The patient had a generalized erythematous rash, 60 palpatory, tachycardic at 200 and tachypnic at 60. He was lethargic, weak, and tachypnic with poor turgor, thready pulse, cold clammy extremities, and cap refill of four seconds. So what do, we, what do I do first? Of course, we, we have to make sure that the patient has adequate saturation, that the patient's blood pressure will be kept at 60 or it should go up. But of course, the first thing you do is of course to put an IV access and to make sure that the airway, the breathing are all maintained. Is he in shock? He's definitely in shock because he is palpatory and you have all the signs of shock. And what is the possible etiology of the shock? The patient has fever. He has some losses on the diarrhea. So it could be hypovolemia, but the patient has this rash. So 
whenever a patient has a red rash with fever, you always worry of the possibility of meningococcemia or an infection. What fluids do you use? Well, always use whatever you have available, which is the crystalloids. And how fast do you give it? At least 10 to 20 cc per kilo. And what labs do I do? The labs can be done later on when the patient's already more stable. You can do your initial labs for uh, blood type and cross. Once you get the IV, you can actually do your initial labs if you really want to. So whenever a patient comes in to us with possible sepsis or a child who is acutely unwell, it is the, the screening is for timely recognition of possible sepsis. Early appropriate suspicion and recognition is the key. There are sc screening tools. And if this patient is a frequent flyer of the hospital, of course, you would be able to access the previous uh, electronic records. But if you're able to do an ex a laboratory test, it is the blood lactate that gives you an index of how sick the patient is. It is a surrogate marker for hypoperfusion or hypoxemia. And a level of greater than two millimoles per liter is associated with a very high mortality. So every institution would have their protocols for septic shock or dysfunction, and you just need to do your blood culture, fluid boluses. And I want to stress that it has to be immediate administration of the antibiotic. The moment you consider sepsis, the moment you want to give an antibiotic, it has to be given as soon as possible. Now, because we're still in the pandemic, I've added that because of this coronavirus, there is still a surge of children with the hyperinflammatory shock that may resemble a typical Kawasaki, which is now termed as the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. So this is something that I will not talk about because it will be another long, long uh, lecture. So based on the National Institute for Health and Child Care Excellence, the NICE guidelines, the initial labs for all age group for possible sepsis would of course be a blood gas for glucose and lactate, cultures, the CBC, the C-reactive protein, the urea, the electrolytes, the creatinine, and of course, a clotting. Children with septic shock should receive antimicrobial as soon as possible within the hour of recognition. Children with sepsis associated organ dysfunction, but not in shock, you have three hours to give the drug. Rationale is because antimicrobial should directly target the cause of the sepsis. And there is no data to support that there is a cut of time after which the mortality rises. But they know that if you are suspecting sepsis as the cause of the shock, give it within one hour, okay? And then of course, choose the appropriate empiric antimicrobial that should most likely cover the pathogen. And something that we are all, that we all need to do, learn to deescalate, according to the clinical presentation and base it on your cultures. Emergent source controls is important. So do the diagnostic test to identify the site of the infection. If the device, the venous access is confirmed to be the source of the infection, after getting an alternative access, you need to remove the source of infection. Removal of the source of infection will lessen the sepsis burden, like the drainage of the abscess, the breedment of necrotic tissue, especially in burns. And you can do this six to 12 hours after the resuscitation has been done and the moment you suspect it. 
Remember, abscesses are poorly penetrated by antimicrobial and can contribute to hematogenous spread. So the final thoughts. One is to recognize shock quickly, have a high index of suspicion. Remember that tachycardia is the first sign and hypotension is a late and ominous sign. Gain IV access quickly and if necessary, use an intraosseous line. Administer adequate amounts of fluid rapidly and remember ongoing losses. Correct electrolytes and glucose problems. And if the patient is not responding the way you think he should be, broaden your differential and think of the other types of shock. Thank you for your kind attention. And these are my references. Um, thank you, Sir Herbie, for that very extensive lecture on shock. Uh, indeed, we learned a lot. And I believe that everyone would agree that it's a very high-yield lecture, right? So um, uh, in the talk, we, we have learned that early management and reversal of shock state is associated with improved outcomes. However, early management is critically dependent upon early recognition and diagnose, diagnosis of shock at the bedside. So failure to recognize the signs and symptoms of shock and to institute a timely and appropriate care leads to higher mortality rates in children. So clinical recognition of shock, as Dr. Kirby said, requires a high index of suspicion. As such, um, all pediatric healthcare providers such as us should be cognizant of the clinical presentation, pathophysiology, and early management of shock. So with that, uh, let us proceed to the Q&A portion. So uh, if you have questions, please type on the chat box. So, okay. So um, we have the first question, Sir Herbie, from Dr. John Fernandez. Uh, what is the maximum volume in ml per kilo can you give for fluid resuscitation? So will large volumes of fluid for acute stabilization increase the incidence of ARDS or cerebral edema? Thank you, sir. Well, in a patient who is a non-cardiac, so we have to make sure lang eh, kasi if it is a cardiac patient, then you, can, you, you are limited, no? So after giving 20 to 40 cc per kilo and you know it's cardiac, then it's about time for you to start uh, your inotropic support. Now, if it is a non-cardiac and your patient is in repetitive shock, then we need to assess why is the patient not responding. And if the patient is not responding, maybe there are ongoing losses. Will excessive fluids cause ARDS? It's more of, yes, it's been associated, but excessive fluid, if you think about it, bakit ka mag excessive fluid kung hindi kailangan? No? So it's parang chicken and egg. Eh. The patient must be very sick. That's why you're, you're, you, you end up giving so much fluids. No? So in those situations, actually, the, the only time that we had a patient that I've given more than 60 cc's per kilo and still in shock are those with severe dengue shock syndrome with myocarditis. And in this situation, the control of the, the support of the heart is actually very crucial. And kasama na dun ang intubation and I cannot forget this kid because we did the intubation, we gave, we placed a central line, we gave the fluids, we gave the inotropes, and yet the patient still expired because on, we did x-rays every four hours and the effusion just kept on increasing. So sadly, there are patients that we cannot seem to to uh, make better, no. But generally, 
giving your fluids up to 60 cc's per kilo, generally up to 60, you should be able to get this patient stable and figure out what is the next step. If in case the patient goes back into shock, you still need to give the extra 20 cc per kilo, but this time you have to find out where is your fluids going. If it is trauma, then hopefully by that time you would be able to emergency type and cross blood and give her blood. And of course, talk to the surgeon for the surgical uh, treatment. Okay. Hopefully, John, I answered that question. Thank you, po, Sir Herbie. I think this is in relation to that question by Dr. De La Sena. So, would there be a benefit in doing point of care ultrasound for shock? Yeah, actually, the point of care ultrasound is not bad. I'm not against it. I'm not trained on it. But the ones who get who are trained, they can help you assessing the the ventricular uh, diastolic volume, if you can still give extra volume. Uh, they can look at the IVC. The, the, the focus can actually help you out. Yeah, yeah I agree. So um, another question, po, sir, um, from Ken Ramos, can you agree? Can you comment on the use of methyl prednisolone at the first sign of septic shock? Oh, methyl prednisolone can only be used if you are suspecting uh, adrenal insufficiency. The patient has a history of chronic uh, steroid use. The patient has a history of bad asthma or bad inflammatory bowel diseases or something. No? So if there is a chronic use of steroids and you're suspecting um, the adrenals are in trouble, then yes, you can give the method for this alone. But until you have that, you cannot just give pred uh, steroids left and right. Okay. So here's another question for Sir Herbie. Um, is tachycardia alone the patient is in compensated shock in dengue. Oh, yeah, tachycardia. Most of our patients with dengue are tachycardic. So when they are tachycardic, this is associated with a, a gradual increase or a rapid increase in the hematocrit. Basically, you actually have capillary leak. That's one. But sadly, not not all patients are exactly the same. Some have capillary leak and some have capillary leak plus myocardial involvement. So in patients who are sicker, then starting a little inotrope may actually be helpful. And among the inotropes, you have epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, dobutamine, my personal favorite is actually dobutamine. And the reason for that is because it has a peripheral vasodilating effect. So you're going to ask me now, I, should, I would probably be crazy in giving something that can peripherally vasodilate. But like I said earlier, I like dobutamine because it can dilate the systemic vascular resistance so if I'm thinking of myocarditis for which you have pump failure, I'm giving this drug for its inotropic effect and I'm giving a peripheral vasodilating effect. So in effect, we have an improvement in cardiac output. However, all of these drugs can make the heart more tachycardic and therefore <laughs> you have to watch that blood Watch that heart rate. And the moment the nurse turns it on and the drug goes in, most of these children can become very tachycardic. And if that happens, you have to cut it down by half immediately. Otherwise, they can end up with an MI. Okay. Um, 
Then that's the reason why for the dengue, because we are considering myocarditis, I use a very ridiculously abnormally very low dose. It's as low as only 1.5 to 2 mics per kilo per minute. And believe it or not, the blood pressure can be maintained with no increase in heart rate. So I'm always very concerned. If you only have one line and you started inotrope, so gagawin ng staff, dun ilalagay ang gamot mo. But you also ordered for paracetamol, you also ordered for an antibiotic. The moment the nurse in pushes the drug through that same line, you can actually push the inotrope and they can go into SBT because I've seen that already. Went into SBT, the whole family that is still at the ER will become so, so difficult to handle because they're going to blame the, the nurse who pushed the drug. Then here you are, you have to come in and say, uh, this is normal, as caso in the normal. So you have to tell the nurse, uh, just settle down first and infuse it next time. Wag mong push. No, because that's one option is actually to put two IV lines, one for the inotrope and one for your other drugs. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, another question. In one of your slides, you mentioned about cardiac silhouette to estimate the need for volume replacement. Could you please elaborate on that? Oh, uh, so chest x-ray, we get the benefit of a cardiothoracic ratio. Eh? So you know that the normal pediatric cardiothoracic ratio is 0 0.51. So pag ang pasyente natin ay dehydrated, then that heart can be smaller, 0 0.4, 0 0.45, 0 0.48. Then that already tells you that the patient is dry. You can also look at the vascular markings. The vascular markings may actually show that the patient is also dry. Now, if the cardiac shadow is big and the patient is in shock, then you have to wonder, so what's the cause of the shock? Is it because the heart is in tamponade? Is it because you have a congenital heart problem? So there are other things to consider if the heart is unusually big. Of course, you want to call your friendly cardiologist to help you out. Kung masyadong malaki ang heart. Okay. So um, how about the patient in shock with no urine output despite fluid boluses? Well, pag wala siyang masyadong urine output, after one to two hours of giving volume, then you already know that you're getting this patient not in the early stage, so medyo late na, and you always want to check through laboratory your BUN creatinine, that's one. Number two, you would put a Foley catheter. Three, if you have the mixed venous, a central line, then you can do mixed venous blood gases. And like I said, you can look at the saturation there. And if the saturation is nearing 70% with your peripheral sats of 100%, then you can tell yourself volume is not going to make the urine come out. Then if your blood pressure is now uh, acceptable, then you can play around with a little furosemide. Radiographically, you can do a, uh, an ultrasound to check on the size of the kidney. Are you dealing with a uh, chronically ill kidney or not? And you can check if in case the, perfuse, the, the blood supply, the arterial and the venous blood vessels, are they all normal? So you have to assess the kidney function already. So a lot of times, pagka walang masyadong ihi, you already know that this child was in trouble 
much earlier, much longer. So we need to call our our nephro friends for this doc. Well, kung papadialize mo na siya, pero with a lot of prayers and playing around with euro, then maybe you you would be able to. Because usually once you resuscitate these kids, considering that they do not have atherosclerosis pa, then you should be able to get them to urinate. The biggest problem you have is when you're dealing with obese teenagers na may mm -hmm. atherosclerosis na, na hindi nila tinatanggap na may alta pressure din sila. No? So the moment that they're hypotensive, that's really a bad, bad uh, presentation. Okay, so we have a lot of questions, but Doc. Um, if, 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 from Dr. Marie Grace Garcia, if you are to use inotropes, what do you think is the best inotrope for each type of shock? The most important thing is for whoever will order it, you have to know your drug. You have to know what you're trying to, to achieve. Like, for example, your patient is a cardiac patient, and you know that, let's say it's a cardiac patient, like a VSD with pulmonary hypertension. What is the best drug? We already know in the cardiac field that milrinone, which is a lucitrope is actually uh, a better cardiac support. However, eh kung wala kang milrinone sa area mo, wala kang milrinone sa, sa hospital niyo, you can, you, can, you can still use uh, dobutamine, you can use dopamine. Eh kung wala kang IV access, you can use lanoxine, the old drug, lanoxine, but we have to be careful lang with the, with the dose. Um, because the worrisome part with lanoxine is that a mistake of a decimal can cause toxicity. No? So just know the drugs, be familiar with them. And if you're familiar with them, because I got trained in Detroit. So in northern part of America, people love dobutamine. But people from Florida, they love dopamine. So if you think about it, most residents will ask this. So doc, which is the better one? No, it's not that who is better. It's more of what do you have and what you're comfortable with. And then look at the effect. Do you get the effect that you are aiming for, which is stabilization of the blood pressure, the heart rate is going down to normal. So you have to remember all of these drugs can cause tachycardia if you are giving at very high doses. So a lot of times I give a little of each one. So like for example, vasopressin is very good for vasodilatory septic shock. So, and that's the reason why in this case, the, the kid, I started vasopressin first instead of the dopamine, dobutamine, epi, but epi is cheaper. So technically, I should have used epi because it's cheaper. Okay, so any drug can actually, you can use any drug, but you just need to be aware of how the, the indications, the side effects, and how it's given. Okay. Um, sir, in relation to that, sir, we have a question here. What is the advantage of isoprasin versus norepinephrine in the management of septic shock? <laughs> Meron bang mas? Actually, superior. actually, vasopressin advantage niya is it constricts the efferent arterioles of the renal vessel. Efferent. And therefore, by constricting the efferent, you are able to maintain urine output by maintaining glomerular filtration rate. 
as compared to norepinephrine, wala siyang pinipili. So, my attitude with norepinephrine is that I can raise the blood pressure by using norepinephrine if I infuse it in a cadaver. Meaning to say, it can cause severe vasoconstriction and whenever I am on norepinephrine, I have to be ready that the urine output will go down. And sometimes it becomes zero. So if that is the case, then I have to titrate down the norepinephrine and decide on using another drug. Okay. Thank you, sir, for that. Um, dami pang question, but sir, this one. Um, granting from Doc Pai, Evangelista, <laughs> granting GI track is clinically okay. And dito din yung SPCCMP, sir, eh. Um, <laughs> meaning there's no abdominal distension. Electrolyte levels are within normal limits. How soon do you feed post-shock? How early is early feeding post-shock? Thanks. Thank you, po. Six hours. Kung hindi, ka, kung hindi ka comfortable sa six hours, sige, 12 hours. You have to just remember that what is the drawback in feeding too early, one, eh kung nagkamali pala tayo, so maybe six hours is too cocky na sobrang aga naman, kakashock, kakapull out lang. But technically, you can feed. So if you want to be safer because hindi mo kayang bantayan or you, you don't want to draw so many labs to make sure that there's no metabolic acidosis, then you go for 12 hours or even the next day. However, ang ginagawa ko parati sa mga pasyente, pinapamonitor ko yung abdominal girth every shift. So every nursing shift, they measure the umbilicus and the, kung saan ang widest. Umbilicus and widest. So if I am not considering that the bowels are in trouble, a simple x-ray of the abdomen can be done. When you do an x-ray of the abdomen, you're, you are expecting normal bowel gas pattern. If there is gasless abdomen, so imagine, gasless and abdomen, the body's normal compensatory mechanism is that if the body is in shock or in trouble, the body will, 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 will switch. No, will shunt away from the GI tract. The body will shunt blood away from the GI tract, and that's the reason why the patient will not feel like eating, and the patient will not tolerate the feeding. So, twelve to twenty-four hours, but the prolonged NPO is bad. Kasi you end up with bacterial translocation. So, kung 24 hours, okay na, try the feeding. Kung nag-worry ka pa, sige, give it another day. After that, you can start feeding. Na. Okay, thank you for that, sir. I think uh, we can entertain three more questions. Super daming questions, sir. But we have <laughs> time. Um, ito po, uh, sir, in cases of obese or morbidly obese patient who has hypovolemic shock and who is not responding in volume resuscitation, what weight should be used? The ideal body weight or yeah. the actual body weight? So ideal. Ganito. You use the ideal body weight as a guide. Now, if you feel that it's too little, then you give extra. Pero small boluses. So generally, sa intensive care, I was taught to give just 5 cc per kilo boluses. 5 cc per kilo. No? Kasi once you give a bolus, hindi mo na may bawi eh. Wala nang atrasan eh. So just be careful. Give 5 cc per kilo and keep on uh, titrating. But sa obese always use the ideal body weight. And then you, you adjust accordingly. But these are just guidelines. No? Uh, mahirap na pag very sick eh. Kasi you really need your, your laboratory to, 
to guide you as to how to increase or decrease. Okay. okay. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, I have to mention this. Um, our consultant, Dr. Sheldon Paragas, commented po, um, cardiac silhouette alone cannot be used uh, in, in the estimation of fluid replacement or assessment of therapeutic response. Objective way is to look for the cardiac indices for intravascular volume, like the IVC collapsibility, LA and LB, filling sizes. So, yun po siya. Um... Another last, second to the last question na lang po, sir. In one of the cases you presented with shock, you were able to repeat ABG every fluid resuscitation. In practice, it's quite difficult to get ABG in patients with shock and also it's coupled with danger of bleeding, especially in patients with dengue. So how soon should ABG be done or after how much fluid boluses? Also comment on giving sodium bicarb right away to address the metabolic acidosis. Okay. Remember, itong pasyente na to, ang ginamit ko ay mixed uh, venous blood gas. So the patient has a subclavian line. So I'm using venous blood gas. So hindi ko na siya tinutusok. So bihira ako magtusok eh. I will do an arterial blood gas to see how good or bad is the lung with regards to oxygenation. Because arterial blood gas, the venous blood gas and arterial blood gas the pH, the pH in the venous is maximum 0 0.01 lower. The PCO2 in the venous blood gas is maximum 10 points higher. But that's just a correlation. So doing arterial determinations, I also hate to do that because it's so painful. I was trained to put an arterial line, but where I'm practicing getting an arterial uh, setup is quite expensive. And because we, our nurses are always changing, getting them to be adept, adept and comfortable in handling an arterial line is not possible because we keep on changing nurses, no? So I usually just go for venous blood gas and once in a while, I do an arterial blood gas. How, how soon? Well, it depends on what you're looking for. If you, are, if you want to see the response, you can actually see the response with your vital signs, your heart rate, your blood pressure, your perfusion, your pulses, your uh, temperature of the extremities, your urine output. So technically, pwede na, hindi naman kailangan kukuha ko parati ng blood gas. Except that for this patient, we did it very frequently because the patient has no urine output. Eh. So the patient has no urine output and the blood pressure was not that uh, normal pa, although it has gone up already, it's not that normal. And in this situation, the only inotrope we started was the vasopressin. But because the patient had a strong history of not being fed for a long time, I felt that the patient was actually drier than than what we can think of or what the mom can tell us. No? So, and that's the reason why I kept on doing it because the reason why I kept on checking on it is just to show to the residents that it does make a difference. No? Uh, but of course, I know it's expensive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir, for that very extensive lecture and for answering the questions. Actually, there are a lot of questions, sir, but we cannot accommodate them anymore. So, in behalf of the PPS, the SMC would like to thank you, sir, for your uh, for your time. I know you are a very busy person, but salamat po sa pag-unlock ng aming invitation. And also, I would like to thank the participants for uh, very ano, actively participating in our question and answer portion. Um, 
we have learned so much from your talk po, sir. So, salamat. Salamat po. And uh, now, I believe all of us are very confident in recognizing and uh, managing uh, pediatric shock. So, with that, let me give back the virtual uh, the virtual floor to Dr. Charlotte Baez. Thank you po once again, Sir Herbie. Thank you also. Wow. That was quite a discussion. Thank you, Sir Herbie Uwe. Um, uh, the participants, we all we, we have at uh, almost 500 participants, sir, for today. Bihira lang po kami umamot ng ganong number, sir. Talagang the participants took advantage of your presence, po, sir. And really uh, actively participated and asked questions from the expert himself. So thank you, sir, for giving us an in-depth yet simple to understand lecture on shock. And also, thank you, Dr. Lim, for moderating the discussion. So at this point, I would like to call the person who made this happen, the, cha the CME chair of the PPS DSMC, Dr. Diana Dadia, to award the certificates of appreciation to our speaker and to our mind. Um, good evening, everyone. I would like to thank personally Sir Herbie for saying yes to our invitation. It was really an honor for our local chapter. So this is the first time that you have uh, given us the lecture. And um, thank you for helping us to have a deeper understanding of shock from a pathophysiologic point of view and for walking us through the physiologic uh, approach to the goals of the management of the different types of shock. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, in behalf of the Philippine Pediatric Society, Davao Southern Mindanao Chapter, I would like to award this certificate of appreciation to uh, Dr. Herbert Michael Gochan Uy in grateful recognition for being the speaker of the lecture entitled Physiologic Approach to the Early Recognition of Shock, given this fifth day of October 2022, signed Dr. Lianos, our president. Chapter President and yours truly. And thank of you. course, I would like to thank uh, your most welcome, sir. So I would also like to thank my dear friend for agreeing to um, be an able moderator for tonight's discussion, Dr. Cheris Murillo Lim. Um, the same certificate of appreciation is given to you with the same citation and signatories. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. And I would also like to thank Pediatrica because our maximum, the maximum capacity of our, of our Zoom, sir, is only 300. And uh, I would like to thank them for upgrading it to 500. Otherwise, a lot of participants will not be accommodated. So thank you so much for this blockbuster lecture. And of course, to our uh, SBCCMP family for uh, participating. Thank you so much. Back to you, Lot. Ayan, yes, hindi lang pala tayo for, from Davao, no? We also have participants from all over the Philippines. So, thank you, Sir Herbie. Thank you, Cherise. Okay, so at this point, let me just um, give you some announcements um, for the upcoming activities of our chapter. So, for the next two Wednesdays after today, <clears throat> we will have... Um, scientific lectures from our pharmaceutical friends. So we will have the uh, scientific lecture from Otsuka on October 12 and uh, the one from Glenmark, Philippines on October 19. Then on October 26, we will have a multi-subspecialty lecture on newborn screening. And since November 2 will fall on a Wednesday, we will have a rest on that day to commemorate All Souls Day. So at this point, uh, I would like to call on the Vice President of the Philippine Pediatric Society, Davao Southern Mindanao Chapter, to formally close our conference. So let us all um, uh, welcome Dr. Jonas Suset Heraldo. Good evening, Doc. Hello, good evening, everyone. So indeed, we just had a very productive afternoon. So our host, Dr. Rabanez, is right in saying that our speaker is one of the pillars of the Society of Pediatric Critical Care 
and also one of the most sought after pediatric critical care specialist in the country. And this is evident by the almost 500 participants in our virtual floor. So in behalf of the PPS DSMC, I would like to thank our distinguished speaker, Dr. Michael Herbert Uy for sharing with us his time and expertise. Thank you again, sir, for emphasizing that we have to be very aggressive in addressing shock. Okay, so to our ABLE moderator, one of the SPCC MPC youngest uh, member, Dr. Charisse Morillo Lim, thank you for doing an excellent job as our moderator. So to all the PPS DSMC members, to the, our visitors from different PPS uh, chapters, all the members of the Society of Pediatric Critical Care Medicine, the residents in training, postgraduate interns and medical students, thank you for spending your Wednesday afternoon with us. And thank you very much for your active participation. Also, a uh, special thanks goes to our host, Dr. Charlotte Banyes, to Dr. Diana Dadja, and to Pediatrica for the technical support. So join us again next week in another specialty lecture with Otsuka Philippines. Uh, keep safe, everyone, and God bless us all. Thank you. Back to you, Lord. Thank you, Dr. Jonah. So before we... Finally, end the evening. Can I please um, request everyone to open their videos for the picture taking? Ayan, with Sir Herbie, naka open pa si Sir. Um, to our tech team, please make sure that uh, everyone is able to open their ano ha, their cameras. Okay, doctors, please give us mga 15 seconds. Medyo madami tayo, no? And oh, smile. Okay. So, give us your best smiles, everyone. Madami nga. Nain sa aking, ano. Okay na po, Dr. Farlot. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you everyone for sharing your afternoon and evening with us. I hope the learnings that we got from Dr. Herbie Uy will help us save more children's lives. So again, I am Dr. Charlotte Banyas. I am your host. But before you leave, um, meron pang mga pakulo ang ating uh, friends from Pediatrica. So if you want to stay, please do stay and uh, participate in the activities that our friends from Pediatrica prepared for us. Thank you. Thank you again, Sir Herbie. Thank you, Cherise. Thank you, Dr. Diana. Thank you, Sir Herbie. Thank you, Sir Herbie. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Next time, Diana, ikaw na magla-lecture. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. So, for those who are still in, please answer pala the post test, yung link nakapost sa chat box. Go Pediatrica! Hi, Tim! Hi, Doc! Hello ako sa aming kagayip live tonight. Ayan. Ayan po. At yan yung ating mechanic is sa uh, in your answers in the chat box. Ito so, natin yung chat box tonight. Paunahan po na ako. Pag-ilisan tayo. The first, at the member, or in the intern, or at the intern, or at the intern, Again, so, um, prizes naman natin tonight is mga taco chips. 
Ano kaya to? The Black Orchid makes you already 58 of Miss Peter Potter. Ito na ako. 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 Ito Panalo is si Doctora Regalado. Congratulations po. Ayan. Next person played the title for you in the 23rd film, The Great Gatsby. Ako. Panalo natin. At ang nakapagbigay ng tamang sagot ay si Doktora Jocelyn Frias. Thank you, Doc. Yan, yung ating question naman is brought to us by our Platera, ating Tumbiotic, with Lactobacillus right arrival with this PSM mode 790. So, our Platera is now available in three formats po. Meron tayong drops for um, children, For newborns at 2 years old, dapat yung ating chewable tablet and for 4 years old, yung mga pagkakitin, yung ating powder format naman for 4 years old. Of course, yung ating Pratera is for diarrhea, colic, and other exercises. Please don't forget Pratera. For this Next naman natin is... Excel and XSTEP Bubble X Your first XSTEP and XSTEP Excel 
gets available in the box and we have zero to six years old where the entire thing is proposed. You have to get 200 expert on Asian Next, Dr. John Ryan Yap. Congratulations, bro. The next question naman po is Ruthie Raini Ruthie Raini Leslie Moon Pagbigyan na ng tamang sagot. So, ang tama ka po is so wide. Congratulations, Dr. Francis Perdigos. Congrats, Doc. Cards. Ayan. So, what is the name of the space radio toy and the toy story franchise? Friends of Nights, Lunar Parasite. Or full power or plus light. Yeah, plus light your phone. Next up, easy for Renyo. Next up, easy. Last question po for tonight, what type of fish is the main character in the picture of the tiny Nemo? Blue fish, brown fish, fish or brown fish. Nemo po ay isang clownfish. Congratulations, Laura Hastina to you. Pas, hello. Hello ulit. Maraming salamat po for participating in our Katika Dream Time tonight. May message lang po namin kayo kung kailan. Prizes. Maraming salamat po. Thank you.
Loco.